Uh, final speaker for the first panel, um, Professor Anoop Malani, um, who's the Lena, I'm sorry, the Lee and Brenna Freeman Professor at the University of Chicago Law School, uh, and also professor at the Pritzker School of Medicine. Um, An Anoop has a PhD in economics and a JD, uh, both from the University of Chicago. Um, he clerked for Judge Stephen Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeals, and, and later for Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court. Um, Anoop does research in law and economics and in health economics. Um, his health e economics research focuses on the value of medical innovation and the value of insurance, uh, control of infectious diseases, the placebo effect. Um, he's the principal investigator on an Indian health insurance experiment uh, involving 12,000 households to study whether health insurance brings benefits to people's health. Uh, that study is being conducted in Karnataka, India. Today, uh, Anup Milani will speak to us on the topic uh, which I'm looking forward to hearing, an economic analysis of medical ethics. Anoop. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for attending this talk. So uh, what I want to do here is uh, begin a, a conversation between economists and ethicists uh, about medical ethics and the relationship between economics and medical ethics. Uh, and in particular, what we want to do, uh, and, and this is joint work with Tom Phillipson and Richard Posner, and, and being a bunch of economists at the University of Chicago, uh, we want to begin this conversation by being slightly obnoxious. Uh, so, so bear with me uh, as I do that. The, the, it's not that we're all mean people, but uh, we want to make a bold claim in order to, to, to spark a conversation, uh, as is our uh, way here at the university, uh, especially in economics. So I want to offer you three propositions. Um, the first one uh, is that medical ethics can be understood uh, as part of uh, the um, economic framework for normative analysis, uh, what we call welfare economics. And so we can think of a lot of, of what we do in medical ethics as really just uh, components of what we do uh, in welfare economics. Uh, a second thing is that uh, we think that putting it in this framework uh, has the added benefit that it clarifies uh, a lot of uh, debates in bioethics and especially fissures uh, in those debates. And the third thing is a, is a positive benefit. Uh, I think what we can do by applying a welfare economics uh, framework to medical ethics is understand uh, or distinguish which ethical controversies or ethical claims are more controversial and less controversial. Uh, and also, and I think this is the part of the talk that I think will be uh, the, the, the most challenging, uh, uh, is um, to try to understand the market for medical ethics. So it's the market for people who practice bioethics, uh, whether it's medical ethics for treatment or met medical ethics for uh, research. So let me begin. Now, I, I, a lot of what I'm going to say is not going to be super controversial. It'll, it'll, it'll seem pretty obvious. But the idea is to warm you up to uh, uh, some of the sorts of, of discussions we have in economics. Um, so, so here are some examples uh, or, or ways where we can translate the language that's used in bioethics, things like autonomy, beneficence, maleficence, justice, things like that, into language that's used by economists uh, and that plug into our uh, normative framework. So uh, as you know, the normative framework is going to be for economists is, is, is a lot like a, a basically a basic utilitarian, consequentialist utilitarian framework, but there's a lot of fleshing out that gets done uh, through positive economics. So let's start out with uh, the doctor-patient relationship. Um, when economists look at the doctor-patient relationship, they view this as basically a principal agent problem. Uh, what I mean by this is that a party, there's some parties in, in this transaction that have more information than other parties in the transaction are getting the, the more, and the less informed are trying to get the more informed to behave better, to behave in their interests. Typically we view this as you know, the doctor having a lot of information and the patient not having a lot of information. Uh, the doctor is the agent, the, the patient is the principal, and the a patient is trying to get the doctor to do the right thing. And that's not entirely true. As it turns out, uh, there's kind of a, a two-sided uh, asymmetric information problem here because it's also the case that the patient has a lot more information than the doctor does about the patient's own preferences. And that's preferences not only over health, but also of consumption. Um, and so we have, you know, something that, that when we think about things like uh, informed consent, which most of you will think about as flowing from a principle of autonomy, or many of you will think about as flowing from a principle of autonomy, um, 
we economists just say, well, what's really going on here is uh, there's uh, uh, information that the physician has about the risks associated with treatment, information, uh, information asymmetry. We want to get the physician to disclose that information to the patient uh, so that the patient can make an informed decision, make a better decision, uh, and, and to be more precise, take advantage of his, her own uh, private information about preferences. Um, one of the reasons why it's important to think of this as two-sided information asymmetry is that it's also possible that instead of informed consent, you could have the opposite, which is if a patient could convey her, uh, her information about preferences over health and consumption to the doctor accurately, the doctor uh, could make that decision as well. Of course, we have to worry about the doctor's uh, incentives as opposed to the patient's incentives. But again, that's where informed consent fits in. Autonomy relates to uh, addressing the information asymmetry problem between doctors and patients. <laughs> Another example, and, and there are many more examples, but I'm just going to give a few other examples. So the first, you know, as I said, the first principle is principal agent problem. That's a very, a many, many ethics controversy can be thought of as just variations of the principal agent problem. Another uh, uh, um, uh, area of economics uh, that can explain um, uh, controversies in bioethics or, or issues in bioethics is, is the idea of intertemporal allocation of consumption. This is allocation of consumption across people over time. Uh, and so the best example of this I think this explains a lot of research ethics. So, so, so how, why is that the case? Think about what research is. So particularly, I, I like to think in the context of, of, of clinical trials uh, and, what, and medical studies and, uh, that involve patients. And often what this is, is uh, uh, research is the production of information uh, that's uh, about medical treatment uh, that's of value not only to, to current uh, patients, but also to future patients. But interestingly, only current patients uh, can participate. Unborn, and I don't mean by this, uh, you know, unborn children or fetuses. I mean, just future generations cannot participate in current research. But they benefit from current research. And so the, the way that we conduct research really affects what future generations get relative to current generations. And so when we have ethical rules, and I know that this might be changing a little bit, but when we have uh, 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 rules that limit research, uh, such as requirements of equipose or limits on wages that you play research subjects, what we're really doing is placing limits on the transfers that current consumers can make to future consumers. And by the way, this is two-way transfers, because uh, when you pay current consumers to participate in research, even in the absence of equipose, uh, you're just paying them with money that you later expect to get, drug companies expect to get from future consumers. Uh, and so it's just facilitating a trade. But bioethics takes a position on this very often uh, and tries to limit uh, or regulate those trades. Okay, so it's regulating the intertemporal allocation of consumption. A third uh, uh, topic within uh, economics that can uh, explain or uh, describe a lot of ethical controversies, the idea of interdependent utility. Uh, a, a more simply speaking, we think about altruism. I may care about the welfare of my children. That's altruism. A doctor may care about the welfare, the utility of patients. Um, um, interestingly, it's not just doctors that have that preference, uh, but ethicists, ethicists can also have that preference. Um, and often it's kind of strange to think about an ethicist having a preference. Obviously, we just ethicists stand outside and observe what other people <laughs> want are making judgments, but no, no, they're not because they're making a preference over what other people, ha expressing a preference over what they think other people should have uh, or do want. Um, and so I don't deny that ethicists, just like practicing ethicists, just like practicing doctors, may have altruistic preferences, um, but they may not have uh, preferences over exactly what we think they ought to have or, you know, they, they pick a particular type of preference. And I think the one that, that strikes me as most interesting is that ethicists often have a preference for health rather than utility, whereas their subjects, uh, whether it be doctors or more importantly patients, have preferences over both health and consumption. And so economists always think about health consumption trade-offs. People are willing to, to sacrifice health in order to get more consumption. By the way, that relates to the discussion that we just had about rationing. Um, but ethicists, uh, not all ethicists, but many ethicists that uh, assert the primacy of health uh, and not want to make sacrifices on health are basically uh, uh, expressing their altruistic uh, preferences over other people's health. But the important thing to realize is that they're expressing they have altruism over other people's health and not utility. It doesn't make it right. It's just their particular preference. Uh, but once you understand it that way, I think it, 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 economics can, 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 can encourage a sort of humility uh, in claims, in bioethical claims about how much we should uh, invest in health and what sort of health decisions we have to make. 
A last one that I want to talk about uh, relates to interdependent utility, but is, is one step further removed. And it's the idea that when you create a social welfare function, you have to assign people weights. Uh, we call them welfare weights or lambda weights. Uh, and, and you know, utilitarian typically we would put equal uh, welfare weights on everybody. That's why it's uh, called utilitarian rather than just additive utility. Um, um, and this is very much related to uh, ideas like justice uh, that you find uh, simply described in, in, uh, in, a, in a lot of bioethics uh, conversations. Um, and then there are implications that flow from justice, but that we understood as just implications that flow from a choice made about what sort of welfare allocations you want. So for example, uh, to be more country, you know, we think about uh, trying to have more egalitarian allocations of human organs. We don't, by the way, interestingly, we don't do this necessarily for blood, but we do this uh, for, for certain other bodily parts, such as organs. And so we implement rules like first in, first, first out, or, or variations of that. Uh, to get allocations of organs. We try to limit the market uh, trades in organs for money. Uh, but, but again, this is imp important for people to realize this is an argument about equal, uh, al equal welfare allocations or equal allocation of welfare weights uh, across individuals. It's not exactly right, but it helps us understand why, uh, how it relates to economics and, and, and how economics has addressed that problem in other areas and why that can be helpful in ethics. Okay. So now why is it that we would even want to have this conversation? First, first is we're just academically interested people, right? You want to talk to people from other disciplines to see how they see a similar problem. Maybe you can learn from that. Um, and so that, and we do the exact same thing. So I think it's important for, for ethicists and uh, economists, medical ethicists and healthcare economists to talk. Um, uh, I'm here, obviously we can learn from, from, we economists can learn from ethicists, but we want to talk a little bit about what economics can help, how economics or the economics frameworks that I'm proposing can help bio and I think that they can do two things. First is, uh, and I use this often when I teach classes, uh, um, even when I do law and economics, I talk about legal ethics. I hear the same thing with health, econom health economics and, and, and healthcare ethics. I think that what an economics framework can do is highlight um, tensions or inconsistencies between ethical positions that people often hold simultaneously. Um, so for example, uh, I would say a modal view uh, is that ethicists believe, relative to economists for sure, that, that, um, uh, that health is more important uh, um, uh, but uh, you know, when they're doing that, uh, they're making an argument about, as I said before, they're basically expressing their own ethicists or expressing their own altruistic preferences over other people's health. And they think that all, people ought to defer to that, to their altruistic preferences. But then when you shift the frame just a little bit, they're not willing to defer completely to altruism. So for example, if a doctor says, I don't want to engage in informed consent because I know what's best for my patient, ethicists will also resist that, even though the doctor basically says, I'm altruistic and I know what's best for my patient, right? So it's okay for an ethicist to express that position, but it's not okay for a doctor to express it. An ethicist exercising that belief will, 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 will argue against the doctor's position. And that's a little bit uh, at tension. Uh, another example uh, is uh, this idea of equal welfare weights. So for example, I, I pointed out how organ allocations uh, evince a uh, preference for equal welfare weights across uh, consumers. Uh, everybody should have access to organs, so we might like, for example, a first in, first out system. But at the same time, uh, ethicists uh, make strong preferences for current patients over future patients when they put limitations on research uh, and, and what you can allow, how much you can pay research subjects, whether or not they can enter trials with they're, they, they're going to get something that they know or that we know uh, might be bad for them. Um, but uh, so that's inconsistent, right? Because um, why wouldn't we weight the future patients uh, as much as current patients? Um, obviously, in each of these situations, ethicists can come back and say, oh, well, that's different because, or this is different because, but it requires that extra line of argumentation. It's not a simple principle. The simplest principle uh, generates some sort of tension across these different views. And again, these are just examples. There are others uh, that we can come up with where the economics framework uh, highlights inconsistencies or tensions. Another thing that I think uh, is helpful is that, uh, and this is kind of moving away from normative to a little bit more positive, but the, I, we, I think the economics framework can help us understand why certain ethical principles are more controversial or, or, or disobeyed than others, um, and make predictions about this. So for example, uh, a really simple one with respect to informed consent is I would expect that doctors who have uh, the benefit of fee-for-service insurance or getting a cost plus reimbursement are much more likely to overtreat, and because they're much more likely to overtreat, are much more likely to hide uh, or, or not disclose side effects. 
uh, uh, for, to patients because that allows them to, to treat more and get more uh, payment. Um, but those are precisely the folks that are going to be uh, the ones that are most likely to uh, uh, disagree with informed consent or, or put pressure on informed consent principles, right? Because they want to uh, not tell people that, that treatment might be bad because they have an economic incentive to actually overtreat. So that's, uh, you know, I expect to see more informed consent controversies when we have a fee for service system than we don't have a fee for service system such as capitation. Another example is, in, uh, and this is an inconsistency or controversy. So in general, and I, I'd say still the modal position for reimbursement, uh, uh, ethical position on the reimbursement of, of research subjects is you're not allowed to pay wages. Uh, you know, you can pay for their expenses, but you're not allowed, allowed to pay wages of research subjects to participate in trials. Um, we don't pay them for taking risk. Now, obviously, I could sit here and say, well, that's really, you know, I don't understand that. We often pay uh, for people out in the real world to take risks. We pay uh, uh, construction workers more, or janitors that work in nuclear power plants more, things like that. We pay for health risks. In fact, that's how we estimate the value of statistical life, is that people have made that choice but get compensated for it. But it also happens even within the realm of medical research, which highlights the inconsistency and why it's, 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 uh, it's uh, problematic. So for example, for phase one trials, we all try to enroll relatively healthy subjects, right? And we allow uh, meaningful payments, uh, and, and we relax the rules there. And I think one of the reasons why we do that uh, is because it would be very hard to recruit healthy people into trials unless you paid them some money. Uh, and you, are, you need them to take on the risk to figure out what the toxicology uh, is of treatments. And so that's another example of situations where there's an ethical rule, but we'll disobey it uh, because it's convenient for us to, uh, or because it's very hard to comply with the ethical rule. We wouldn't get the research uh, otherwise. Another example is assisted suicide, right? So assisted suicide is controversial. Um, although uh, not allowing, uh, not assisting with suicide is consistent with ma maleficence, this is the one situation where uh, a patient, uh, the patient population generally is in favor of the principle of maleficence, which is to say avoid harming patients, but this is one situation where they actually want you to harm them. They actually want to, uh, perhaps some, uh, want to uh, end their own lives because of, for example, pain and suffering they're experiencing because of a sickness. Um, and again, the reason is because the population that the Maleficence principle is supposed to benefit actually in that case is not being benefited. Uh, so there is no uh, uh, gain uh, in some sense from uh, complying with the principle. That's what becomes controversial. Now let me get to the what I think would be the, uh, if I were sitting in your seat, the, the most obnoxious thing that I'm going to say. Uh, maybe there's a lot already, but, but this is the one. And, and, and this is kind of a puzzle, and I, and I think that, that uh, uh, I, I'll express it in a way that's, that's not entirely friendly, but I think that it gets at a deep problem uh, that, that I think ethicists ought to care about. So when an economist looks at the market for medical ethics, uh, that is to say the market for uh, people who provide ethical advice, medical ethical advice, um, we notice two things. First is the prices paid for medical ethics advice is very low. Ordinarily, when we see a market with really low prices, we think, hey, there should be a lot of demand, right? Prices fall, demand is, uh, grows, but you don't see that. You see also low quantity, uh, and that's a puzzle. Why is it that we see low prices and low quantity? In fact, this is, by the way, the, one of the reasons why we actually took on this topic, is we just saw this interesting point where people weren't pay, don't have to pay for me, uh, ethical advice very much, yet don't seek it out. By the way, it's not unique to medical ethics. Legal ethics has the same problem, uh, which raises the broader principle question for ethics. But, but this is a context where you know, it's really interesting that you know, a doctor providing medical treatment get, gets paid, but an ethicist providing ethical guidance about that treatment does not get paid very much. Um, and so, so here are some, some, some interesting facts that, that, uh, that uh, kind of uh, validate this or express these, this, this basic point, which is you know, hospitals, again, we've only looked at uh, uh, secondary research on this. Hospitals often are, uh, offer ethics consultants for free. They pay them with a salary. But, uh, but they're not utilized a great deal. Uh, utilization of, of, of ethic, ethics consults is quite low uh, uh, quantitatively. Uh, even though it's free. Um, also, interestingly, insurance companies are not paying uh, uh, for ethics consults, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, very much uh, or very frequently. That's on the, the treatment ethics side. But if you look at the research ethics side, same sort of thing. It's not like researchers and potential subjects are the ones that are paying for ethics consults. What's going on is basically the, the government has imposed IRBs on uh, research institutions by regulation, uh, by threatening the withholding of uh, grant funding uh, if you don't do that. And, and 
and, and universities and other research institutions often comply, sometimes go beyond what the government requires because of fear of, of consequences, uh, regulatory consequences. Um, so that's an interesting thing. Again, it is government-led demand, not, not private demand. Uh, again, consistent with this idea of low prices and low quantity. Um, and you see other facts also supporting this. So for you know, you look at medical uh, board exams, a very small percentage of them are about ethics. And if ethics were important, that would seem to be, for treatment and treatment decisions, you would think that they would be more, that would be more common. Um, you see the AMA's uh, uh, code of medical ethics is very short. It's rarely enforced. That contrasts, for example, with medical malpractice liability. But why is this the case? And now here's, I want to I say two things that I think are, are Again, I apologize ahead of time. These, these are a, a little bit more aggressive, uh, but for the purpose of, 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 of uh, generating conversation. One is that I wonder, we wonder if treatment ethics are not actually binding. Uh, we, we wonder that, that when treatment ethics promote efficiency, they're not binding. People would engage in them anyway, and so we don't need the ethics controversies, okay? Um, uh, it, it's, 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 it's when ethics is not uh, uh, efficiently, efficiency promoting, uh, promoting that it's most necessary, but that's why we see very little demand for it, because it's not efficiency promoting. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the first claim. I, I hope that makes sense, which is, if this is just about efficiency, it would happen, people do the, do the ethical thing, even without the ethics consult, because it's efficiency promoting. You don't need ethics. Ethics is not doing a lot of work there. Ethics is doing a lot of work when things are not efficient, as between two parties. And in that context, the two parties don't want it and you have to impose it from outside. Uh, but then you have to ask why you're imposing it from outside. The second thing I would say uh, is uh, for research, that, that works with, treat uh, that explains treatment ethics perhaps, perhaps but research ethics is a little bit different. Um, well, our position is that if, if we allowed for a full market uh, for research subjects, for example, if you allowed payment of wages for research subjects, uh, you would have uh, obviously patients coming in, taking risks, um, uh, to generate information and getting paid for it. Um, but, uh, and, 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 and that would be fine. That's just like you know, a janitor working in a nuclear power plant. The problem is that when ethics rules uh, limit that payment, right, they collapse that market. And so then it has to intervene again to re-regulate that market. And that's where challenges emerge. So uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost as if what research ethics is doing is creating a problem and then trying to fix the problem that it's created. And economics would say, wait, why not just allow wages? Uh, and that's how things work in other markets. We don't have the ethics of construction, uh, the ethics of the construction industry. We don't have the ethics of, uh, you know, interesting, the car, if you're thinking about asymmetric, we don't have the ethics of uh, the auto industry. But we do do it for uh, medicine. Uh, we do do it to some extent for law. Uh, and it partly could be because of, of regulations uh, that limit the market itself. So let me stop there. Actually, I stopped halfway apparently in the middle of that sentence. Um, uh, what it meant to say is that research ethics matters because it limits that market. Okay, uh, let me start, stop there and then, and then uh, take, if we have time, take some questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Professor Malani's uh, controversial arguments? Tracy? Hello. So as both the ethics consultation director and the vice chair of the IRB. Oops. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and duck. <laughs> so I actually think ethics consults is the wrong way to look at it. Most institutions, not the University of Chicago, but most institutions are going to putting ethics under quality. And ethics, they are hiring full-time ethicists that are fundamentally working on lots of things beyond the consult. And the consult is sort of the step of, of there's nothing else working. Mm -hmm. But setting up policies, doing daily rounding. And I think that they are investing in ethics. And then from an IRB standpoint, number one, we are paying research subjects. We're paying research subjects to take care of, to, to do drug studies. There's lots of drug studies. We're not paying research subjects, but there's lots that we are. And even though, yes, it seems very regulatory, we've had at least two consumer support groups, two consumer groups that have come after protocols that fundamentally many of us in this room have argued about, including the support study, as well as there's also one in New York about from an endocrinologist on CAH research, that they, were, they thought that despite regulation, it was done unethically. So I think we have to have some regulation to prevent things becoming completely unethical. 
and we can all argue over those two, if those two cases were actually unethical or not, but fundamentally, there are groups that fundamentally want research regulated, in addition to other groups that want research unregulated, and I think we have to maintain some degree of regulation, and the new common rule will probably decrease the level of regulation nationally. Thanks. So I, I don't think that, I, I, I wouldn't say that we don't pay research subjects, we just pay them very little. So we compensate them for their time, we compensate them for medical expenses, but we don't pay them wages like I get paid, for example, to teach. So we don't see patients being paid $100,000 or $120,000 uh, to engage in clinical trials, even if the benefit to the, research, to the, to the drug company would be great to, uh, in terms of being able to finish the trial more quickly. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons why, I, at least we would conjecture why it is that patients groups worry about the, the ethics of trials is because when you're making the payment very low, not zero, but a small amount, below market wages, um, you are imposing risk that's not fully compensated, and so the, uh, uh, the consumer groups, the patient groups, are gonna fight against that. And our conjecture would be if you paid a higher wage, they would not fight as much. Uh, so way, another way to think about this is imagine if instead we allowed research subjects to unionize. What would they do? Well, they would probably allow the research trials to continue, but would want a really high wage, and that would be fine by us. Um, and I think that that, I mean, I guess economists would say that even that would be better uh, than just trying to artificially uh, put caps on the wages. Again, wages are not zero, but they're not market wages uh, if they're a free market. This is the last question, Far. Far Curlin. Um, how would your analysis change if the, the, the framework that you think gives rise to ethics is not one of, of uh, unequal um, information and a need for information transactions, but a, an acute and profound sort of human vulnerability that gives rise to a profession like law, a profession like medicine, not so much to the car industry. A vulnerability in the case of sickness or in being accused by the state of some kind of crime in which you need a helper who you can't form a written contract for the kind of help you need with, from them, and you're not in a position to enforce that contract because of the vulnerability you're in. So it seems, it seems to me the reason you have legal ethics and medical ethics and you don't have auto manufacturing ethics is because of a very different sorts of human vulnerabilities to give rise to those professions. So I guess I would, I would want to ask what, what you mean by vulnerability. I'd want to unpack that because uh, does it mean that they, as I was asserting, they have less information? Is it because they're poor? Is it because they don't have the mental capacity no, to make a decision sick. on their own? No, it's because they're sick. But, but uh, lots of people are very sick and have mental capacity and can be quite great advocates for themselves. Why is it that we think as a class people with sickness? Uh, well, because, well, I guess, I mean, this might be something that's easier seen inside the practice. But when someone is sick and all the act activities that go into your care of them can't, are, cannot be structured by a, what is my contract, what are you paying for, they, they, ha they require judgment, they require a lot of action when the, other person, when the person cannot make an assent and can't consider all of the options. It, it just seems like they, they don't work like the sort of transaction which you consider the car to buy or something. So like I, I don't think it has to do with the contract. Very few transactions I engage in uh, are about contract. It's just making an arrangement or a deal or an agreement, often verbal, and I do lots of it. Um, I, I guess where I would p poke at this is I'd say I, I'd want you to be very precise about what you mean about vulnerability because what ends up happening is, is two problems. First is that vulnerable patient, there are classes of people that are not vulnerable that we also treat as vulnerable and then don't treat. So for example, a very competent prison, prisoner could participate in a clinical trial involving prisoners. Not all prisoners are vulnerable. I think we o expand that category beyond what it really needs to. For example, the prisoner one. Uh, another example is that we allow that vulnerable patient to make not to make decisions about health care, but we allow that same person who's very vulnerable because of the sickness to make decisions about a ton of other things and we respect those decisions. And so it seems like we're inconsistent even when they truly are vulnerable, we're, we only will care about them when they're making health care decisions, which seems inconsistent. And I think that what that broadly means is that I think that we need to be a little bit more precise about what we mean by vulnerability. And once we do that, then again, we can fit it in within a framework and devise more precise. I, I believe those people need to be helped, but we need to help them in a way that's most effective. Thank you. And you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.